Good morning. Let's proceed into our study time today and see what we're able to find. Shall we open with a word of prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we may spend together. We ask, Father, for your blessing and your guidance. Show us, Father, that that we need to understand. Be with us today. Show us things that we need to consider so that we may more completely understand the studies that we have been engaged in and may be better prepared for the message that you would have us to give. We thank you for this opportunity to join together. We ask, Father, as well, for your continued traveling mercies for Theodore, for your guidance for us today, and that you show us that that we should consider. May your will be done in all ways. May we be able to understand and show your character to all of those with whom we come in contact. For this, Father, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, yesterday we were going through some parts of what Uriah Smith had written regarding the 12th chapter of the book of Daniel. There's many points that Smith had in looking at this portion that we may or may not agree with today. Smith had a very literal view of many of the things that were going on. Now, we're going to look at another today that has presented some views that may be a bit strange to us. Maybe we're going to be able to find some things in this. Maybe we're not. So, okay, before us now are a couple of chapters written by an Adventist theologian. Have any of you ever heard of Roy Allen Anderson? Yes, I have. Are you familiar with some of the books that he has written? I think I read one of them maybe 30 years ago. Okay. Now, the book that this is taken from is called Unveiling Daniel and Revelation. And as I recall, his book on Revelation was published about 1975. His book on Daniel would have been published, let's see, this was republished and copyrighted in 2006. Is there one book in particular that Anderson is known for? I mean, it is a book we've talked about multiple times throughout these studies. The reason for our consideration of what he has written here, Anderson was empowered by the General Conference along with two other men. The last name of these three are Froome, Reed, and, of course, Anderson. And they were known by their acronym of FRIDA in putting together questions on doctrine. So Anderson was one of the three that helped to foster to the world likely the worst book ever to be published by the church. Let's keep this in mind as we look at what he has to say. I am not attacking this situation, I just want us to be aware of it. Now, the first paragraph here. The end of the 18th century saw both the end and the beginning of many things. Not only did 1798 mark the end of the 1260 years of papal dominance, as predicted in Daniel 725 and 127, it was also the portent of the Industrial Revolution and the Scientific Age, to which we refer more definitely in the next chapter. Now, when we are looking at Daniel 7.25, the verse reads, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change the times and the laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. And 12.7 And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Are we looking at exactly the same time frame? Is this 1260 days? described in Daniel 7, the same 1260 days as being shown in Daniel 12. 
And are there any symbolic representations that we can take from either of these verses that have bearing upon our understanding of prophecy today? Well, I look at this, and if I reverse the digits of Daniel 12, 7, I come up with 721. I come up with midnight. It's interesting to me that Anderson would be so very forthright in agreeing with this portion of the 1260 years, but for his time, he would be so very myopic and not see the 1260 years that preceded it. Now, his next statements, it is difficult for us to picture the world as it was at the close of the 18th century. In 1797, the first cast iron plow was patented. Mechanized farming began to receive great impetus. Now, Anderson is looking at this from a very literal perspective. At this point, is he adding anything to our understanding of the prophetic message? Now, he continues. Gabriel's message to Daniel was given in order that God's people godly Jews and Gentiles alike <clears throat> might prepare themselves to stand in the day of final destruction. And among the messages of the angel, none is more vital than the one found in Daniel 11.36 to the end of chapter 12. The angel spoke of a power that would arise in the time of the end, Daniel 11.40, which would raise, would wage an intense war not merely for the bodies of men, as in the days of slavery and labor camps, but for the minds of men. It's weapons, not military hardware, but challenging ideas. The most bitter conflict is where human beings are hungry, longing for food and freedom, for education and the comforts of life. It is an ideological warfare waged in the name of humanity. Science and education are the watchwords of this new era. The fundamental conflict is not political, but religious. Does this go along with what we were talking about yesterday from what Smith had written? It's also interesting to me that here is Froome going back to Daniel 11.36 and giving reference and combining this with Daniel 12. Excuse me, Anderson, not Froome. <laughs> now, he addresses in part of this the so-called age of reason that came upon the French, he then also begins to address the time of the end was marked, therefore not by the rise of military might and incredible technological advancement, but also by sweeping changes in philosophy, science, and religion. The way he's chosen his verbs, he's placing the time of the end in the past, saying that it was marked. rather the current that it is marked. While atheism and infidelity have existed in the minds of certain philosophers throughout history, these philosophies are today being taught in the classrooms of high schools and colleges all over the world. In thousands of books and magazines and by television programs, the theory of humanity's evolution, as opposed to the Bible's account of creation, is being presented as if it was a proved fact. Now, in this portion, which is supposed to be about Daniel chapter 12, Anderson jumps and begins to introduce concepts from Revelation. According to the Bible prophecy, when the papacy was fully recovered from the deadly wound, Revelation 13.3, inflicted by the state in 1798, she will play a vital role in the closing scenes of Earth's history. Now, here again, this book was published in 2006. And he is placing in the way that his words are written to say when the papacy has fully recovered. Would we believe now that the papacy has recovered from the deadly wound? Not fully recovered. Okay. He hasn't persecuted yet. Yet, what does Mrs. White say about this? <clears throat> Will the papacy be the one to persecute, or will it be the daughters of the papacy that will look to persecute? I thought it was the daughters of the papacy behind it. I mean, my, my understanding is that Rome is going to be even more surprised 
when the daughters of the papacy are choosing to persecute in the same manner in which Rome had persecuted at one time, that the time of the mother is past, that now it is the time of the daughters to take the stage. <clears throat> now, if I'm if I'm wrong, I stand ready to be corrected. Yeah, the papist, papacy is instigating everything. Right. <clears throat> Jesuits and such. And so they come on the stage, right? They come to the forefront. So here, Anderson writes, so in this prophetic picture, we see a great political power being guided by a corrupt church. And in verse 14, we read, these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The next chapter of John's book unfolds the final collapse of a great religio-political colossus. Here we are to, we're, we're referenced to see Revelation 18, 8 to 24. These verses seem to be an enlargement on Daniel 11, 45, how the books of Daniel and Revelation complement each other. Now, Daniel 11.45 would read, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. If we were looking at Revelation 18, the first portion of that book deals with the fall of Babylon. And by verse 8, we begin, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Now, this portion of Revelation, is this dealing with the events prior to the close of probation, or is this dealing with the events after the close of probation? And I'm asking because I want to compare Daniel 11.45 and this portion of Revelation. <clears throat> what would we think? I think it's post COP because it says, therefore, in Revelation 18, 8, shall her plagues come in one day. I mean, okay. That sounds like the falling of the seven last plagues to me. I would agree. Now, is, does anybody else have a point? Any of, anybody else have a thought on that? Would Daniel 11:45 occur prior to Revelation 18, 8 through 24? I don't think so. The reason I asked the question that way. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. My opinion would be that Daniel 11.45 is occurring prior to Revelation 18.8 through 24. That Daniel 11.45 leads up to what we're going to see occurring with Daniel 8 or with Revelation 18.8. Now here well, and the first. Story, oh, yeah. so I trust the first part of Daniel 11.45 is before, but the second part where it says, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. And that sounds like the, you know, post, post probation to me anyway. It could very well be. And it may be that we have to divide that verse. But what I'm seeing with Revelation 18 verses 8 to 24 would look to be definitely after the close of probation. While dealing with unfulfilled prophecy, we must be cautious. Should we be cautious in giving a word of warning to the world? Are we not to give a warning, a clear sounded warning? Correct warning. A correct warning. <clears throat> so here is Anderson. He's being extremely cautious. He does not want to look to, to, quote, misspeak. He continues that yet it appears that politics, economics, and religion will ultimately combine to bring about the long envisioned world government. Now, is this an agreement or disagreement with the understanding of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? Is he attempting to be too literal here? 
He continues, doubtless many and varied influences will play a part in bringing such a program to fruition. Those leading the way to the long dreamed of world government have the apparent objective of international peace, a truly laudable aim. But the apostle says that at the very time when the world will be complaining, will be proclaiming peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them and they shall not escape. It is not that God does not desire peace among nations, but until men's hearts are changed, there can be no lasting peace. Uh, This quote reminds me of that guy. I don't know if he was the head of the World Bank, but he was one of the big wigs, and he said that the death of so many people, we hope that it's done quietly and peacefully. I mean, how sick can you get? Right. I mean, we, we note a lot of changes on different things that are occurring. There are these these men that view themselves as being overprivileged, that they believe that they are smarter than everyone else, and that they should be in control of what the rest of the world is doing. In at no time does it say that man is to be above all other men. If that reminds we, me. Go ahead. I was back to Egypt with the Pharaoh. It's the slaves. Right. Same mentality. It is. I agree. Now, Anderson continued. The world government is not the answer to the world's dilemma. Increased military might is not the solution. Technology and human ingenuity is insufficient to meet our need, whether it be an energy crisis, a political crisis, a financial crisis, or a religious crisis. Only the coming of the Son of Man, the indispensable man, the God-man, can bring the peace for which all men and women hope and pray. Now, the way in which Anderson wrote this, I have to wonder if this is not setting the stage for those that would be deceived at the very end. Now, reminding us that this is supposed to be Anderson's study on Daniel 12, how little we're finding that he is addressing this portion of this of this book. We come here. Most of the stuff he's saying we already know, you know. Right. And it's, it's common ground, not elaborating much or it's pretty cross-refer- much, cross-referencing much, I'd say. It, it's pretty back, much back, rehab. Back, really. Huh? Could you agree that it's kind of a rehash of things that we've we've already covered? Yeah. Yeah. Now here, at the beginning of his 19th chapter of this book, he writes, And at that time Michael stand, shall, shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. These opening words of Daniel's last chapter are deeply significant. The previous nine verses picture events leading to the creation of a great world government. This masterful attempt of man to govern himself will be his final challenge to the living God. So Anderson wants to introduce Daniel 12.1 here. Now he wants to combine this with Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14, because as he is stating, in Revelation 16, 13, and 14, the prophet John speaks of the spirits of demons coming from three great sources, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And the prophecy declares that these powers will gather the whole world to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. The scripture further states that they will be gathered together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. When that happens, a mighty voice is heard from heaven announcing it is done or it is over so here anderson continues in a very literal vein are we to be looking today for a battle of armageddon or is armageddon already continuing around us spiritually spiritually yeah the spiritual war so would we have a literal war occurring I don't have to be literally back east, back in the area of Megiddo there, if it was literal. <laughs> if it was literal, right. Yes, yeah, so everything else has to 
which is it's not even a mountain. It's a war so. for the, yeah, it's a war for the minds of men right now. They call it fifth generation warfare, and AI is greatly involved in it too, as along with pharmaceuticals. Everybody's got their hand hand in it. It's kind of amazing for us to realize how all of this that has been pushed on the world is combining to create issues to delude the people. And as as it is noted from the chat, there is no literal mountain of Megiddo. I believe there's a valley of Megiddo. Now, <clears throat> as Anderson continues, all is finished. Then the great demonstration of organization and power the world has ever known will collapse. For at that time, God himself will step in and take over rulership of this runaway world. The prophecy declares he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Daniel 11.45 It is then that Michael stands up, the great prince, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Now, as we had addressed before, when Michael stands up, we are seeing the close of probation occur. Because when he stands up, he leaves his position before the mercy seat. Is that correct? Yes. He goes from there to put on his garments of vengeance. When there is no intercessor between God and man, the cry comes, let he who is filthy be filthy still. Let he who is wicked be wicked still. Let he who is righteous be righteous still. <clears throat> this is a poor paraphrase, but it is indicative of the fact that Christ is preparing to come. <clears throat> so what does the standing up of Michael mean? Here, Anderson states, it is, some, is this some intervention of one of heaven's highest angels on behalf of the Palestinian Jews? Many times there are those in and out of the church that do not look that Michael is Christ. Now, Anderson continues, Note three important words in this brief account. Michael, Lord, and Archangel. And here he's, he's referring to Jude 9. He who rebuked the devil and raised Moses from the dead is the one who will yet call to life and immortality all who have died in the blessed hope of the resurrection. Talking to Martha, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And at another time, the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Now, we go through these passages. We understand that those that have passed are at rest in their graves. They are not currently in the presence of God. Yet God remembers them and is prepared to call them from their grave. The voice of the archangel is the voice of the life giver. His authoritative command will sound through the world, awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, then the earth shall cast out the dead. At that time, all who have died believing in God's word were tossed aside their coverlet of dust and spring forth joyfully into eternal life. The name Michael means who is like God. He is like God because he is God, one with the Father from all eternity. Now, in this portion, we would not have a disagreement with Anderson because he correctly identifies Michael as being Christ. Yet, how is he addressing the prophecies that we would find in Daniel 12? That is where he started yet we don't seem to be getting very far. Now here he again repeats Daniel 12, 1, and states they will be delivered not because they are Jews or Christians, not because they belong to a certain group or denomination, but because their names are written in the book, the book of life. It will be worth everything in that day to have our names in that book. 
During that awful time of trouble, there will be a partial resurrection. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The resurrection spoken of here is not the general resurrection at the time our Lord is seen coming in the clouds of heaven, for then the righteous only are raised. Says the scripture, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on the second death hath no power. On such the second death has no power. But the rest of the dead, the wicked dead, live not again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation 20, verse 5. A short time before our Lord appears, there will be a special resurrection. This is emphasized in Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, says John's prophecy. And they also which pierced him. In Matthew's gospel, we read of a special resurrection when our Lord rose from the dead. So again, there will be another special resurrection associated with the second advent. But my question remains, how is he truly applying Daniel 12 with all of this? Directly, as I prepared this the other evening, I only went through what amounts to being seven pages of this of this book. I found a few interesting points that we're going to be getting into here in just a moment. But I'm a, I'm a little surprised that Roy Allen Anderson, who was so honored by the conference that in the 1950s, he was chosen as one of three to defend the beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, has such a very surface understanding of anything that's going on in, in the 12th book, the 12th chapter of Daniel. Now, he returns again to Daniel 12, 2 in this paragraph toward the bottom. According to the words of Christ himself, those who pierced him, those who mocked and derided him in his dying agonies will be raised to witness the coming King of Kings and Lord of Lords returning in his glory. Not only many wicked, but also many righteous will be raised, for the scripture says, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Could there be anything more thrilling for those who have faithfully proclaimed God's last message to the world than to come forth from their dusty beds to witness their Savior returning as a conquering king accompanied by all the holy angels? Ellen White speaks of those who have died in the faith of the third angel's message as coming forth to hear God's covenant of peace. Here he gives reference to the great controversy, page 637. Now, as Anderson would continue, the promise in the next verse has a special meaning for us today. And they that be wise from the margin stating teachers shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they shall turn many to righteousness <clears throat> as the stars forever and ever. Daniel 12, 3. What was it that we were taking from Daniel 12, 3 as far as our understanding of this and its relation to our present studies? What was it about they that shall be wise that was important for us to look at? The Hebrew number of that which says shall be wise is Hebrew 7919. So it could be an interrelation with the year 1979 or 1997. But it is a primitive root to make circumspect or hence intelligent. Now, these that shall be wise will turn many to righteousness. Was there anything else when, when we were going through this with Daniel 12.3 that we need to pay attention with? Do any of us remember? Now, Anderson continued, the stars have always attracted thoughtful minds, but in recent years we have learned much about these heavenly bodies. His statement, I, I don't know if it's a very humble statement. Now, continuing through here, Anderson wants to press. Are you planning to be among them? 
Are you planning to be among the stars, dear friend? You can be if you accept God's gift of righteousness. Over the last several Sabbaths, we have had conversations about the need for our characters to be more like Christ. We have the opportunity to see our characters become like Christ. We have the opportunity to accept God's gift of salvation. But does God ever offer a gift of righteousness? For what does it mean to be righteous? To be like Christ. Does it also not mean that we have struggled with sin? Amen. Now, God has had to struggle with sin. Christ has had to struggle with sin. They have overcome sin. We are being offered the gift that we will be able to overcome sin. But I would disagree with his his comment regarding God's gift of righteousness. Yes, it sounds as if he's saying Christ is doing it all for us. So all we have to do is pray, Jesus, come into my life or my heart, and it's done. And this is what I'm hearing from some friends of mine. I'm trying to correct them. Here again, how many times must we see, how many times must we address that while there is a a gift, that there's a gift of salvation, that we have a part to play. We have to decide, are we going to do our part or are we going to think, Oh, Christ has done it all. We don't have to worry. We can just go on doing what what we're doing and asking for forgiveness every time that we fall. Now, brother Dwight. Yes, brother. Yes, brother. I'm gonna ask this question, and I I don't know if you, <laughs> if I should or not, but I'm gonna ask. When you overcome something, that means you have to be committing it, right? I would agree. Well, it, did Jesus? <laughs> The question is, I reckon, did Jesus, did Jesus sin? I believe that Jesus was touched by sin, but I don't believe he ever sinned. Right. So, okay. All right. He was tempted by sin. He was tempted, but he didn't yield to it. Right. So, did he overcome it? Amen. I would say, yes, he overcame it. Okay. All right. All right. I may, I just, I, I, okay, good deal. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Now, as Anderson continued, having finished his great prophecy, Gabriel now tells Daniel to shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end, implying that many things the prophet did not understand would at that time be understood. Then Daniel overheard one asking the question, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And the answer came from the one clothed in linen. It shall be for a time, times, and a half. That, of course, is the same period mentioned in chapter 7, verse 25. The 1260 days, prophetic days or years, which began in A.D. 538 and ended in 1798. At that time, many things not understandable in Daniel's day, nor could they be until the expiration of the period, would come into sharp focus. Even though the prophet himself said, I heard, but I understood it not, verse 8, yet we who live in the time of the end can understand how privileged we are. Now, as I was, as I was preparing this, There is a portion that Anderson entered into that I couldn't understand why he placed it the way he did. So I marked that that portion that I'm not repeating with an ellipse. When we returned to this, again, Anderson begins, as the angel closed his message to Daniel, he said, knowledge shall be increased, Daniel 12, 4. The accuracy of this needs no emphasis. Now, Daniel 12, 4, of course, reads, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book 
even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, we went through this. Why is it intriguing when we are looking at these Hebrew numbers to consider carefully the Hebrew number for Daniel? What do we see here as when when we are looking and studying using Esword, what do we find the Hebrew number of Daniel to be? From the chat, it is 1840. Does this have anything relevant to say to us today? Was 1840 a pivotal year in the understanding of prophetic word? Neil, just by yes. a list. Addiction. Okay, thank you, brother. Sister, you were saying? I was just going to say the same thing. Were you referring to? You dropped out there referring to what? Lich. Right. So we're we're talking about August 11th, 1840, right? Yeah. Yep. Yet here, Anderson proceeds to state the accuracy of this needs no emphasis. Think of the hundreds, the thousands of things we use, which were unknown and undreamed of at the beginning of the time of the end. Nuclear power and space travel. The increase of knowledge is not only in science, but also in biblical studies. In 1799, at the beginning of the, quote, time of the end, unquote, the Rosetta Stone was unearthed by Napoleon's soldiers when stationed on the banks of the Nile. Deciphering that stone was a difficult task, but it gave scholars new tools to decipher other ancient artifacts. Numerous points of Bible history have been confirmed as a result. Knowledge that has helped to confound the claims of the school of rationalism. Much more truth is understood today because of the increase of knowledge, both in sacred and secular history. Yet here is a man who was empowered by the General Conference to defend the faith of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Rejecting Lichtus. Rejecting Lich. Exactly. He continues. Daniel, still eager to understand, asked, Oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Again, the voice answered, The words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end, verses 8 and 9, or until the the crisis at the close, according to Moffat. While none of the wicked shall understand, yet the wise shall understand, said the angel. Daniel 12.10. And understanding, they become teachers of truth, preparing a people to endure in the great day of the Lord. At that time, all nations will be convulsed, and the unprepared will flee in terror, calling for the mountains and the rocks to bury them. They cannot endure the blazing glory, vision of glory that they see as they see Jesus riding forth in power with all the holy angels to deliver his people. Having defied the living God and giving their allegiance to Satan, they will at last be compelled to witness the disintegration of the colossal world government. Now, we've talked a bit about and using the charts yesterday about this one prophecy. Here, Anderson chooses to combine two prophecies into one paragraph. Pay attention closely to the way in which he's written this. Daniel's book closes with the mention of two prophetic periods, the 1290 days and the 1335 days. See Daniel 12, 11, and 12. The 1290 days or years might well have begun with the alliance of church and state under King Clovis of France in 508. From that important event, the period would then reach to the time of the end, 1798. The 1335 days being an additional 45 days or years could bring us to 1843 when the great Advent awakening reached its height. What do you take from the way that he's written this paragraph? What are you seeing in the words that he has chosen? Well, he sounds unsure because he says, might well have begun with the alliance of church and state and so forth. 
Could we agree that he sounds unsure? Yeah, yeah that's that, that puzzles me. Making it up as he goes along, almost. Puzzles me why, why he doesn't talk. And from, from the chat, would we agree that he's casting doubt that these periods took place in the way that he's describing? Um, uh, Seemed to be that way, yeah. Now, the next paragraph I found very interesting, and there's a couple of small points we're going to address. Inasmuch as Gabriel was commissioned to make Daniel understand what would befall his people, the Jews, in the latter days, some have wondered if the 1335 prophetic days or years might refer to the Hagria or the Muslim era, which was exactly 1,335 lunar years. The Hagria began with the flight of Muhammad in A.D. 622 and would thus end in 1917, a short time before World War I ended and the Ottoman Empire collapsed. The last coins minted for the old Turkish government bear the date of 1917, and on the reverse side in Arabic numerals, 1,335. So here, the application is being made that this 1335 has much to do with the number of lunar years of the Muslim era. Now, the chart that we were referencing yesterday that Stephen had shared with us on the WhatsApp ch chats has a completely different application of 1335. Now, it's interesting to me that Anderson would be pointing to this as being valid for consideration of the 1335. It was within five years after this that the Ottoman Empire collapsed, five years according to the Gregorian calendar. Now, <clears throat> the point that I found most interesting that came up in reference to this is the note that we're going to address next. In the book, this paragraph is placed on page 178. Here again, we have the digits of 187. So Anderson is pressing his point on the one, 1335. This comes out on this page of the book. I'm having to ask if this might be a symbol for those of us that are currently studying. Anderson continues here to say the Middle East awakens. The collapse of the Ottoman Empire, which for centuries had ruled that area of the world, not only gave new opportunity to the Jews as a nation, but led to tremendous changes in the whole Middle East. Little did anyone realize how vast were the oil fields in that part of the world. Lands that for centuries existed in poverty suddenly became wealthy beyond computation. And riches which have meant power to these people. Additional light will doubtless be shed on the 1290 and the 1335, for the path to the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Proverbs 4.18. Till we get more light, we do well to keep alert and watch for God's providences. Does this sound to you as a man that is convinced of the light, or is this someone that is in doubt of light that is, has been being provided? He sounds as if he's in doubt. Like light is not poured upon us uh, unless we're keeping alert and watching for God's providences. We can't be right. passive. We cannot afford to be passive any more than we can afford to be asleep. For what good is a sleepy watchman? Can a sleepy watchman warn the people? Or a drunken watchman. Or a drunken watchman, correct. The last words to Daniel were, Go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest, 
and stand in thy lot in the end of days. Daniel 12, 13. Moffat translates this as, go and wait for the end. You shall rest in the grave and then rise to enjoy your share at the end of the days. Now, I'm sure that if Theodore was here, he would have quite a bit to say about this use of Moffat's translation. Because I don't know if this is a good rendering of this verse. So, Anderson, as he begins to close this portion of what is supposed to be his study of Daniel 12, comes with a question. Some might ask, where is that grave that entombs the remains of the great prophet? Charles Boutflower says, by common consent, Jews, Sabaeans, and Mohammedans declare that the prophet's body lies close to the Acropolis in Sushan, or Susa, near the place where he received the great vision recorded in chapters 10 to 12. I'm going to ask you, those of us that have attended these morning meetings, was Daniel in Sushan in the palace, or was he in vision in Babylon seeing what was occurring in Sushan in the palace? Daniel was in vision. Was this not many years before the Medes and the Persians had taken control and built their palace in Sushan? Uh, Yes. So here is a man, again, honored by other men who is not fully reading the Bible correctly. He put it how far he's off on some things. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. it's some somebody like him that's an academics and <laughs> wants to get to the heart of it, he ain't got to the heart of it. But yet this these these are the type of people that have provided written word, supposedly expository word on these portions of prophecy. And the church wishes to believe that they were being led of God. I mean, crazy. We look, go ahead. I just said it's crazy. You know, <laughs> we look and we read Daniel eight one to three that in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel. After that, which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Sushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Ulai. Now, in all of these situations, Daniel 8, 1, Daniel 8, 2, coming down into Daniel 8, 3. We are having this vision, and yet they are all the same type of vision. They are all calzone. They are all the great vision, the panoramic vision of world history. Now, Anderson continued. He farther states that when Abu Musa al-Ashari invaded Persia in AD 640, it was reported that he sent word to the Caliph Omar, that when he entered the castle, he found a chamber under lock and key. In this situation, Anderson is attempting to make use of the work of another man. He is looking to consider that this person is a Bible student and that his work, his, his work is worthy of consideration as being something to be presented to Bible students. On entering, he saw a stone coffin wrapped in gold brocade, which was the body of a man of great stature. Inquiring who this might be, he was told that the people of Iran, amongst whom he lived to the day of his death, called him 
Daniel Hakim, or Daniel the Sage. When Omar heard the story, he ordered that the body in the coffin be reverently buried where the people of Sushan could no longer have access to it. Accordingly, the stream which supplied the city with water, apparently a canal cut from the Uli, was diverted and a grave made in the dry channel after which the waters were allowed to flow over the body of Daniel. Here again, he's making the use of the of a book written by another man, Charles Botflower, in and around the book of Daniel, pages 223-224. Where the body of the great prophet actually lies is a matter of interest, but not of a particular importance. He rests only until the great resurrection day when the righteous dead will come forth immortal and glorified. Is it important for us as we study Bible prophecy to have to consider rumor and innuendo? Well, it's not in Miller's rules, that's for sure. No, it's not. Now, is there anything from what we've looked at today, from what Anderson had, pre- had presented, that has been in accordance with Miller's rules? Very little. No, there isn't. Oh. Are we able then, if we were to use the the manner in which Anderson was presenting this, are we then able to rightly divide the word of truth using the way that Anderson was presenting all of this for our consideration? Not at all. Uh, No way. (laughs) You don't even know what he's talking about. So here we are today. We need to be able to consider from what we are seeing as we are addressing these points, the ability to go in making use of Miller's rules, making use of the symbols that are presented before us and consider for ourselves at this time all that we are being shown. Anderson looked to be largely incapable of doing this because he was doubting comparing line upon line. Here was a man that was making use somewhat of a historicist's viewpoint and somewhat of a futurist's viewpoint. Both see that in that both of these are the antithesis of the way that Father Miller had been shown that we were to be studying scripture. Would you agree or disagree? Well, historicists, yeah. Can we place all Bible history in only in what's gone on in the past? Or are we to place all Bible history someplace into the far future? Well, the past talks about the future. Exactly. As I'm, as I'm looking at this, I would have to say that Anderson was unable to see how the prophecies were unfolding before his own eyes. This story about Daniel the prophet from Charles Boutflower, it, it's, it's a nice consideration, but it has little to do with what we have been looking at. And so if, if we were looking to make use of what Anderson has written here, it would almost be as if we were accepting things that would confuse us rather than help us in our understanding. Now, we are coming close to the close of our time together today. There are some other documents I have prepared just in case Theodore is not available for tomorrow. Do we have any questions or comments of what we have covered so far? Does this help us to consider many of the points that have been coming out in the studies and the work paper that Theodore has been preparing. Well, the stuff we read this morning is pretty. It's all... You're you're kind of breaking up there. I'm sorry. God is no longer speaking. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven. We thank you for these opportunities that you have provided us with to look, to compare, to study, 
so that we might better understand the symbols and items that you would have us to consider for this time in earth's history. Help us now, Father. Guide us so that what is done may bring glory to your name, that we may give the trumpet a certain sound, not a tentative sound, but a definite sound of warning for those that currently live in this earth. Help us to this end. Direct us today. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. We thank you. Amen.